We have a lot to talk about, and we only have you for an hour, so I want to get to it. I think the main thing that I want to get out of you tonight is you seem to play this game differently than everybody else. Um, you know, there's in the history of Silicon Valley, um, there's only one guy who's created three companies that were worth more than a billion dollars each, and that's Jim Clark. And he did it with Silicon Graphics, right. legitimate company, Netscape, legitimate company, and Healthion, which never <laughs> right. would have been a billion dollar company right. without a bubble, True. but all sort of in the same industry. Yeah. You've done it, if we, count, um, if we count SpaceX, even though it hasn't exited, but it has a multi-billion dollar contract, so I think we can count it as more than a billion, right? Yeah, SpaceX is a, a, a private, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pri private market valuation, sort of a couple billion dollars. So, right, yeah. so, so you're the only other guy who's done it, and you've done it with payments, probably one of the hardest industries to disrupt on the web, cars, and going to space. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you do so differently? So later this year, by the way. Well, so, oh, yeah. But do you count as a, as a co-founder for that one? Uh, no, actually, they, they offered to have me be uh, listed as a co-founder, but I, I thought that, um, uh, although I had suggested the initial idea, I did not put enough um, sort of sweat equity into it to uh, be considered such. You should have been, because you could have been the first guy with four. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, it's it's uh, I, I think there's sort of a certain threshold of, <laughs> of idea contribution and um, you know, initial effort uh, that's, that's required for that. That's sort of, you know, I mean, it's sort of, sort of subjective, but I, think, I don't think I did enough. Right. They did offer it to me, but I, I said no. So it, is part of the reason you've done this that you are sort of crazy? Um, are you lucky? I, you know, I've, I've been thinking about that lately, um, <laughs> <laughs> and and I I sort of wonder, you know, um, I think I probably am a bit crazy, uh, but uh, I think but maybe that's a, that's sort of a healthy sign um, because at the point at which you conclude you're not crazy at all, then you probably are. <laughs> so the fact that you you I mean, realize it's sort of a recursive a bit. thing, yeah. Um, there's one story that I've heard about <laughs> do you. Do I that, seem crazy? Yes. I've yeah, always, probably I've always do. said that about you. Okay. Here's the story that made me think you were crazy. Okay. Um, and you can tell me if Does this is. Does this involve the New York Times? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Elon got me in so much trouble several years ago. And it, yeah. I, he called someone a douchebag and a liar, and I no, started no, it, laughing it, and never actually, lived it down. Actually, to be precise, douchebag and an idiot. We actually said a liar. We cut out the liar. Oh, did I really? Yeah, because oh, okay. we thought it would be libelous. That yeah, part that, we cut. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that, that may, well, I guess that's probably true too, but, but I, I think it's more, more the first two, yeah. More the first two. Yeah. So, um, no, this is the story that made me think you were crazy. Yeah. I heard right after you sold PayPal, before the other two companies, um, you went and bought um, a McLaren S1. Because uh, F1, you, yes. F1, <laughs> right. sorry. That, no, that's, that's the same part. So, <laughs> right, because, uh... Partially because you were going to race cars with Jim Clark and Larry Ellison. Um, no, well, not really, no, actually, and I never did. Um, although that was one of the things that was sort of talked about at one point, but I never did. In I've fact, I've, I've never raced yet. anyone with McLaren. With, with, I had it for several years, I put 11,000 miles on it, and I drove it from LA to San Francisco. It was my daily driver, which is a crazy car to have as a daily driver, particularly on the 405. So, um, but, but I understand when you got it, yeah. you're driving down 280, and you wrecked it, no, uh, well. And you, th let me just tell the yeah, story and then okay, you can correct all right. it. Because the story is great and I, I hope mean, it's Yeah, true. let's see if the story that so, you tell is actually, how, does that, how that compares to the, the reality. Because the reality is pretty messed up. So, hopefully <laughs> the reality is better. So you wreck the car, you get out of the car, you're doubling over with laughter. And the <laughs> really? person with you said, why are you laughing that you just wrecked this car? And you said, no, you don't know the funny part. It wasn't insured. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> the punchline's correct. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was actually, I was driving up uh, Sand Hill Road mm -hmm. um, with, with Peter Thiel, one of the co-founders of uh, PayPal. We were actually driving to see Mike Moritz. Mm -hmm. um, this is in, in uh, 2000. And uh, so we're driving up Sand Hill Road. I didn't really know how to drive the McLaren. And uh, Peter says, so, so what can this do? <laughs> and then like, I'm probably number one on the list of famous last words. I said, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, so I floored it. I floored it and did a lane change um, on, on Sand Hill. And so the, the McLaren has no uh, 
a traction control or anything. It's just it's massive power to, to the wheels, so sort of 640 like brake horsepower, and it, it only weighs a, a ton. So it has massive <laughs> power to weight. It can break the wheels free at 80 miles an hour. Um, so broke the rear, the rear end free and, and started spinning. Um, and uh, I, 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 I sort of, uh, let's see, I think it was sort of, I was, I was going straight and then turned, um, and, and, and I remember seeing the, 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 the cars coming towards me while I was going backwards. And then we hit, the, hit an embankment, um, sort of a 45 degree embankment on Sand Hill, which tossed the car into the air like a discus. And it kept, ro it kept rotating with about three foot of air, air clearance, according to witnesses. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then slammed down on, on, on the ground, going the original direction. Um, and, and we blew the suspension out. Uh, and uh, now, it didn't actually wreck the car. The core chassis and the engine were OK. Thank um, God. But, but all, all the glass and the, the wheels and everything was, was shredded. And, um, and th there was massive body damage in the front and rear. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, and did you start laughing? Um, I don't recall laughing. Um, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I could have been laughing in shock, uh, but I don't recall laughing. Um, and, um, and, then, and then Peter uh, caught a, hitched a ride to, to Mike. I, I, I waited while the, the fire truck and the ambulance arrived, then finally the... Did Peter Thiel literally hitch a ride? To... to like... To, yeah, over to, to, to Sequoia to, yeah, and then, and then I, I once, once the car was uh, taken care of, then I, I, I hitched a ride too. <laughs> um, and so, and we, we, we continued the meeting. That's, I'm picturing you and Peter Thiel, like that scene in Tommy Boy, where yeah. like the deer, and you're both like, ah, yeah. and like. Yeah, really. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. Is there a parallel? Lucky to be alive, really. <laughs> I, I should say so. Yeah. Is there a parallel with how you build companies in that story? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see yeah, what this be, thing can do. <laughs> uh, yeah, watch this. Um, that, that could be awkward with a rocket launch. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing if you've got a one ton car versus um, a million pounds of TNT equivalent. That is a little dicier. Yeah. Um, now, what I think is so, I mean, one of the things I find so interesting about you, what, the rest of the PayPal guys, um, they get done with PayPal. They start starting and investing in Web 2.0 companies at a point in time when everyone said, that's insane. That's insane. The internet will never come back. They right. were considered the crazy ones. Meanwhile, you move to LA right. and start working on SolarCity, SpaceX, yeah. Tesla's a glint in your eye. Yeah. Um, why didn't you, will you ever do an internet company again? Do you find the internet boring? Um, I think it's unlikely that I'll do an internet company again um, because, uh, not that I find the internet boring. I mean, I'm still sort of, I think I'm relatively sort of net savvy and interested uh, in, in the internet and what's, what's going on. Um, you know, I, I don't ever want to be the, the like, like grandpa who doesn't do email or something like that, you know. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think, um, but, but, but I think it, it, I'm trying to allocate my efforts to that which I think would most affect uh, the future of humanity in, in, a, in a positive way. And um, the, I, I think there's, there's lots of entrepreneurial energy and, fi and, and, uh, and, and financing headed towards the internet, um, whereas uh, in certain sectors like automotive and solar and space, um, you don't see new entrants. You don't, there's, not, there's not a lot of uh, capital going to startups and uh, not a lot of entrepreneurs going to that, into those arenas. And the, 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 and, and, and the problem is that in, in the absence of uh, some um, new entrants into an industry, you, 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 don't, you don't have that, in a, that, that force for innovation. It's really new entrants that, that drive innovation more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that, that's why I have uh, devoted my efforts to those, those industries. Um, and, and there are industries that require as I said, you know, cap, cap, quite a bit of capital to get going. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even with SpaceX, I mean, I, I invest, uh, I mean, I ha my proceeds from PayPal after tax were about $180 million. 100 of that went into, into SpaceX, 70 into Tesla, and 10 into SolarCity. Um, and, and I literally had to borrow money for rent. Um, so um, that was, um, was, was that a close the call. Plan, or? No, that was not the plan. So what was, <laughs> what was the plan? You thought, oh, I'll just put 10 in each of these? or? Well, actually, I thought um, for SpaceX, I thought it would be about, well, I guess I was probably about double. I it, would cost, it ended up being double in, in, in most cases. So with SpaceX, I thought it would be 50. 
with Tesla, I thought it'd be, I thought I'd be putting in 25, maybe 30. Um, with Solar City, for well, Solar City actually went really well, um, and that's that's the one where I wasn't a co-founder. So maybe that's a good sign. <laughs> um, I mean, I should, I should co-found less stuff. Um, uh, so that's. Um, so what happened? Yeah. Why did you have to put more money in the other two? Or did investors flake? Did you have? Well, I didn't actually seek investor funding for the first um, three rounds of, of SpaceX. Uh, because, I mean, the first thing that investors want to ask you is sort of, well, what's, tell us about prior successes in this field. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, what could we compare this to? Uh, and, um, and there's, you know, the, when, when you've got kind of the donut in the success category and a lot of, you know, a, a cemetery full of failures, then they, they're not that keen. And I mean, rockets are just pretty far out of the comfort zone of most venture capitalists. Um, right. uh, and, and um, now we were able to, to get venture funding after we've made some progress and demonstrated that we were able to um, almost get to orbit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, you know, credit goes to sort of to, to Founders Fund, and uh, which is obviously some of my compatriots from, from PayPal, Peter and Peter Thiel and Luke Nosek and, and um, mm -hmm. Ken Harry and, and the other guys. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and, and they, they invested before we got to orbit, so, so credit to them for that. But, but I did have to show that I could actually make stuff. Like, I, I never actually made physical stuff before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before SpaceX. So let alone rockets. So you started with a rocket. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, and uh, it's the, the probability of success was low. In fact, when I started SpaceX, I thought that the most likely outcome was failure. Um, but... Um, and, and I think to have any other expectation would have been irrational. So, so why did you want to do it? I know for Tesla it seems more obvious, like, oh, save the planet, big automakers aren't doing this. I mean, I think it's sort of fairly obvious why it's right. good for humanity. Why did you feel like SpaceX needed to be done? Well, um, I, I, uh, I, I guess um, the, if, you, if you look at the, the trajectory of space technology and, and, and progress, um, the, the pinnacle of, of that progress was, was around maybe 1969, 1970, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with, the, with the moon missions. And so we, we, we made incredible, incredible progress in the 60s, and, and then we were able to land on the moon. And then with the space shuttle, it could only get people to low Earth orbit. Now the space shuttle is retired, and that's just a, 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 a there's, there's no trajectory of improvement. It's a trajectory to nothing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I kept thinking that there would be some plan to send people to Mars because that's the obvious next step. And um, the, the actual origin of SpaceX is, is, is um, when I was, um, I think it was around 2001 or so, and I was visiting a friend of mine, Adair Ressi, who actually um, you, you may have met, uh, mm -hmm. but he, he lives in Palo Alto now. Um, he, we were college housemates. And uh, he asked me what I was going to do after PayPal. And I, I said, well, I've always been interested in space. But I didn't think that there was anything I could do in space as an individual. So my initial plan in space was actually to uh, send, um, to do a small uh, mission to Mars with, uh, with a greenhouse, essentially uh, seasoned dehydrated nutrient gel in a little greenhouse that would land. And you'd hydrate the gel. And then you'd grow the plants. And you'd have this great shot of, of green plants in a red background. And that would um, be the money shot, essentially. <laughs> um, and, and, and the. People tend to respond to precedents and superlatives, and this would be the furthest that life's ever traveled, the, uh -huh. the first life on Mars, as far as we know. And, um, and that, that would get people excited. And I thought, well, that would result in an increased NASA budget, and then we could send people to Mars. Because that's, you know, I think you, you want to have a future where you're expecting things to be better, not one where you're expecting things to be worse. Mm -hmm. um, so that was how things started out. And then as I learned more, and I, I, I went to, uh, speaking of crazy things, went, went to Russia three times to, um, negotiate a deal to buy a couple of, uh, of the largest ICBMs in the Russian fleet. Um, <laughs> a strange experience. <laughs> um, How do you even get into that negotiation? Uh, well, you talk to people who know people. Um, and, and, and pretty soon you're talking to the Ru Russian rocket forces. And um, you know, they, uh, it turns out Russia is quite, quite a capitalist society. Uh, <laughs> um, and and uh, so, but it definitely has had some, some weird meetings um, in, in, in places like that I swear they looked like a sanitarium or something. I don't know. 
It's, it's very odd. We keep um, going back to the theme of crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, seriously, this place had padded walls. Uh, <laughs> you're like, why do you have padded walls? <laughs> it was weird. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I had there was some, some sort of Russian guy who was missing a front tooth started yelling at me. <laughs> because his friend, one of his front teeth was missing, he was like spit flying at me <laughs> in a place with padded walls. I'm like, this is really bizarre. What's happened to my life? <laughs> right. And that was the moment when you thought, I'm going to build my own rocket. Yeah. <laughs> that was probably, the, when I got back from that third trip, I was like, I, well, I realized that the, the real issue, the reason we haven't advanced um, in space is because the cost of, of space transportation has is, is be become unaffordable. It, you know, it's, got, it's become more and more expensive to do, to do less and less in space. Mm -hmm. And we really need to improve the technology of space transportation. So that's why I started SpaceX. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, it, it may seem odd that I would start SpaceX with an, with an expectation of failure. But um, bear in mind that my initial uh, thing was to do um, essentially a philanthropic mission with a 0% chance of success from a financial standpoint. So it, was, it would have effectively been uh, a donation to the cause. Mm -hmm. um, and so anything better than that is a win. Right, right. So you know, I know people think of you as someone who's had a lot of success, but you had several failures within SpaceX before yes. the recent launch. Can you, can you tell us well, a little bit sure. about what it's like to put that much work into something and, and, and be doing something that really no one else is doing. Yeah. And at least trying something and putting that much of your own money in it that you're having to borrow money from friends to pay your rent and there are launches and it's failing. Yeah, that, uh, that, well, it super sucks, um, <laughs> I have to tell you. Um, yeah, that, 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 that was, uh, 2008 in particular was, 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 was awful because um, we had the third launch failure in a row of of our Falcon 1 vehicle at SpaceX. Um, and um, we, uh, the Tesla financing round that we were raising fell apart because um, the economy was going to tailspin. Um, and it's pretty hard to raise money for a startup car company, uh, you know, late 2008 when GM and Chrysler are busy going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, was, that was tough. And then Solar City had to deal with uh, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Stanley had to renege on the deal because they themselves were running out of money. Um, so it looked like all three companies were going to die. Mm -hmm. And I was also going through a divorce. So that was definitely a low point. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but fortunately, the, the fourth launch worked. And, um, and then. Uh, Did you think the third launch was going to work? Was it a shock that it didn't? Um, well, I, I, I thought it would most. I think I thought the odds of it working were, were better than fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, there was just a little little change um, in the thrust transient of the first stage engine that resulted in um, that we didn't we couldn't see it on the ground um, because of the thrust transient. Well, to get slightly technical for a second, um, the the pressure decay on the tr thrust transient dropped below sea level pressure. So when you when you look at it on the test stand, at with you know at sea level you don't see it. It doesn't it doesn't look like there's a thrust transient, and because we changed the architecture of the engine uh, to one that was regeneratively cooled instead of ablatively cooled, um, it had this little tiny transient which caused the first stage to ram the upper stage, um, and th and the, the upper stage engine started started inside the interstage section, mm -hmm. like it's like sort of firing at this giant en this engine indoors mm -hmm. with. Uh, with a big plasma blowback that fried the, fried the upper stage. Wow. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. So, <laughs> so it's 2008, you're going through a divorce, which like some, to borrow your word, douchebag bloggers are writing about to make even worse. Right, uh, yes, that's true. Um, in addition to, <sighs> to all that stuff happening, I was getting dumped on massively in the press. Right. Yeah. You're, you know, it looks like all three companies yeah. are going to fail. I mean, why do you keep going with all three? Like, I feel like even a lot of great entrepreneurs right. in that situation would have been like, I I've already sunk everything I have in these companies, and I got to pick one. But you didn't. I mean, you kept doing all three. Why? Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a very tough call. Um, at, at the end of 2008, that was, that was probably the tough, you know, one of the toughest calls I've had to make um, because I could either um, reserve capital for one company or the other. I mean, fortunately, Solar City didn't need a ton of capital, so they were, they were okay. Um, but between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla, um, you know, it's sort of like, like if you've got two kids, and what do you do? 
do you spend all your money to, to, to maximize the probability of success of, of one, or do you, do you try to keep both alive? Fortunately, mm -hmm. it worked. <laughs> um, you also had to step back in as the CEO of Tesla. Yeah. Um, my, my goal was never to be the CEO of Tesla. Um, from the beginning, uh, I mean, I've had an interest in electric cars that goes back 20 years to you know, when I was in college. In fact, I used to talk to my dates about electric cars. It's probably not the best strategy. Close those um, dates. No. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I uh, usually have to stop talking about that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I, I, I've had a long, long standing interest in electric cars. Um, but do, since I was doing SpaceX, um, I knew that if, if, if I did try to start an electric car company and run it, um, that it would be extremely painful uh, to run two companies. So I, didn't, I, try, I really tried my hardest not to be the CEO mm -hmm. of Tesla. I mean, I could, any, at any point from day one, I could have been the CEO because I had majority control of the company. Right. Um, but uh, uh, I really tried not to. And in the end, it was at the end of 2008, it's, I had to commit um, all of my reserve capital to, to Tesla. Um, all that, and that wasn't allocated to SpaceX. And uh, so uh, I, I, I felt I had to sort of steer the ship directly. Um, but it was, it, was not, it was not out of, uh, it, was most, it was really not fun, like right. super not fun. Yeah, I remember when we talked, I, I guess maybe the next year after that, you said, you know, this is not at the fun level, running these two companies. No, I mean, it's definitely gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, um, with, with SpaceX, you know, we're, so we're, since we've now had five successful launches in a row and we're able to dock with the space station, and with uh, Tesla, we're able to raise enough capital to get the company to um, be able to produce the Model S mm -hmm. uh, and, and do the IPO. And uh, you know, so and I've got a much strong, I've got a much strong, a much stronger team, a lot of bench strength uh, mm -hmm. at both companies. Um, so uh, you know, I can go from essentially almost every waking hour being being spent on the companies to ninety percent, <laughs> which is a big difference, actually. Um, is the ambition still to find another CEO for one or the other? Um, well, I, uh, um, I I expect to run both companies for the foreseeable future uh, because I've, I've made a commitment to the people at both companies uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I will, will I be running both companies forever? I, I think that's, that's unlikely, but, but certainly for the foreseeable future, I will be. Is there one that has your heart more than the other one? Um, well, no, they, they, both, they both do have my heart, um, but um, I think that there may come a point you know, uh, several years in the future um, where the, the fundamental good that Tesla is trying to accomplish, which is to serve as a catalyst for the um, acceleration of sustainable mm -hmm. transport, um, has been accomplished. In other words, uh, that, I mean, that's really what, what, what has the, if you look at it from a, an historical standpoint, or, or, or what, what's important here in um, affecting um, the world, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's to, to what degree is Tesla serving as a catalyst for the advent of electric vehicles? Mm -hmm. um, and um, at some point, you know, when, when uh, say most cars being manufactured are electric, then um, te that will have been accomplished, and um, or, or the, the catalytic value of Tesla will right. will have been realized, um, and the re diminishing returns in our garden. I think at that point, um, I, I would not need to run the company. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about across the companies um, your experience with venture capitalists? Because it's been pretty varied, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you've had good experiences and you've had not so good experiences. Is that I've fair to say? Had a wide, wide range. <laughs> yes. What have you? What <laughs> What would you advise entrepreneurs watching this or in the audience to make sure, sure they don't they don't live through what you did in the bad experiences? And can you tell us about the bad experience? Um, well, I think, I think one thing that's important is uh, if, if you have a choice of a lower valuation uh, with, with someone you really like or a higher valuation with someone you have a question mark about, take the lower valuation. Um, it, it's better to have a, a higher quality uh, venture capitalist who you think is, would be great to work with than to um, ha, you know, get, a, get a higher valuation with someone where there's even a question mark, really. You know, I think that's, that's important. 
It's sort of like getting married, you know. I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe I haven't been that good at that. Uh, but we'll probably but learn. tenure's okay. I mean, it's not too bad. It's... Did you do that wrong? Did you maximize for valuation? Um, the, I suppose in, in the case of the Tesla Series C, um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, at some point, I think I'll, I'll tell the, the full story, but... Not tonight. But not tonight. Um, <laughs> the, they did wait an hour. Right. No, I know. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell, part, I'll, tell, I'll tell part of the story. So um, the, the, there, was, um, there, were, there were two... Well, there were multiple competing bids, but there were two competing bids. Um, uh, one was from... Uh, Kleiner Perkins, the other one was from Vantage Point. Um, Kleiner offered 50, a $50 million pre-money, Vantage Point offered 70. Um, I actually said to John Durer that if, if John joins the board, mm -hmm. we'll do it at 50. Um, but uh, John felt that there was, that, that he, he had too many obligations mm -hmm. and that uh, there was another partner at Kleiner who, who really wanted the deal and so he could not supplant that person. Um, and I, I, I thought, well, we could do, I, I, would, I would be okay if, if John Doerr joined. I, I, I mean, there's a 40% difference. That difference has pretty significant. I thought if, if John would, would be willing to join the board, then we could do that, but not if it was somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that was probably a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so then they did Fisker instead, which... And that was their mistake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. But I, I hope they live past the election. <laughs> Fisker and A123 are both having a lot of issues. Yeah. What has Tesla done that it hasn't fallen in that bucket? What was, I mean, looking back, was right. there a crossroads where you made a right choice that has put you guys so far? I mean, you're not profitable yet, but in a different category. Uh, well, Tesla is a, a really different company to, to Fisker. I mean, we're, T Tesla is a hardcore technology company. Um, and and we, we do really serious engineering. Um, and, and I think you only build value in a company if, you, if you're doing hard work to solve tough problems. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's why companies are valuable, or it's why they should be valuable, and, and largely is why they're valuable. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and we, do, we, we, do our, we do real manufacturing as well. I mean, the, the Model S, coils of aluminum and plastic pellets come in and cars come out. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we do real, hardcore manufacturing, uh, quite vertically integrated. Um, and uh, the, the, we did all the vehicle engineering, all the powertrain engineering, all the software. Um, and um, whereas, uh, and, and we, also, we also, of course, do the, the, the styling and design of the car. We've got a great design studio. Our head of design, Franz von Holzhausen, is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the case of Fisker, um, it's, it's headed by, or was headed by, um, you know, Henrik Fisker. And, uh, and he's, he's a designer, so he's, he's good at sort of the styling of the cars, um, but he thinks it's all about styling, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, and it's not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's really, this is, you know, the, the, the reason we don't have electric cars is not for lack of styling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the time when you were getting started with Tesla, um, the Valley was trying to take a turn back towards science and towards saving the world. Uh, you had Kleiner Perkins, Coastal Ventures, a lot of these big firms really getting aggressive about clean tech and saying that was gonna be the next internet. That has not been the case. Right. Um, why did clean tech not work for the Valley? Well, um, I think the jury's out on clean tech. Um, I think as far as Tesla and Tesla and Solar City are certainly uh, clean tech, or I'd say, I, I think of more like sustainable energy stuff. Um, I think sustainable energy is a better, it's a little bit, bit more of a mouthful, but it's more accurate than, 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 than clean tech. Um, and uh, I mean, I think the, I think, I think Tesla is going to be an extremely valuable company in the, in the long term. Um, and what have you done differently? Because a lot of VCs okay. have said, um, well, the problem with clean tech is you have to rely on subsidies, and if you have to rely on subsidies, it's never going to work. I mean, people buying a Tesla, in part, get a subsidy. It takes down the price, I assume, yeah. with Solar City. So it's like, th like, that hasn't been a knock against you guys. Like, why have these two companies worked when, when so many other ones haven't? 
Um, I, I think it's, you know, in, in any industry, there are only a few companies that, that kind of get big and, and, and succeed. Um, and um, I, I don't know, I think I, it just seems that um, in, in, the, in the case of Tesla, we, we were focused on making great products uh, and, and doing, solving hard engineering problems. Um, I mean, there's evidence in Tesla for the fact that we solve hard, hard engineering problems is the fact that uh, Toyota and Daimler and Mercedes, you know, buy electric powertrains from us. I mean, they, if this was easy, they would just do it. Right. Um, so, so we focused on solving really hard uh, engineering problems at, at Tesla. Um, you know, like I said, that contrasts with Fisker to some degree. And, um, and then at, at Solar City, the, um, so Solar City does everything except the, the panel. So um, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that the solar panel, if it's a standard efficiency solar panel, the difficulty of manufacturing that is about as hard as manufacturing drywall. It's really easy. Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, I mean, it seemed to me pretty obvious that in the long term we'd see um, cutthroat competition between uh, uh, silicon um, PV manufacturers in China, Japan, Germany, and other places, um, much as you see this competition in the DRAM market. I think mm -hmm. the PB market and the DRAM market are very similar. Um, and so you, that, that cost would be driven down to, to a very low number, uh, approaching the raw material cost, really. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, that's pretty much what happened. And, and so the real, the real cost of solar and, and real challenge with solar is what's called balance of system. It's everything except the, the, the panel. And, um, and so the, 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 the cost per installed watt for a residential system might be around $4 now, mm -hmm. which is a big drop from where it was a few years ago, it used to be sort of seven, eight dollars. Now it's, it's sort of kind of half that. Um, but the optimization really has to be at the at everything except the panel, because the panels are, are dropping now to like ninety cents a watt. Mm -hmm. So you know, over three you know three dollars of, of the four dollars is balance the system, which in, you know which includes the um, you know it, it includes the, the custom ownership experience, the designing the system particular to a particular rooftop, installing it, the wiring, the inverter, after sales service. Uh, the, uh, figuring out the financing, uh, system, the founding, fa financing of it all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's in the same way that, say, say Dell. Dell doesn't make the CPU or the hard drive or the, the, the RAM or anything, but they kind of right. design the system and they manage the customer experience. And um, that's that's kind of how Solar City is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when, when I looked at the problem of um, solar power, uh, that that that's what it looked like to me. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, Solar City is working on the problems that it's working on, and it's doing super well um, uh, with, uh, you know, 90% of the credit, 95% of the credit due to um, Lyndon, Peter Rive, and the rest of the team at uh, Solar City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you've said, um, I think this is the first time I've interviewed you and you haven't said it, that being an entrepreneur is like standing on the edge of an abyss, looking into abyss <laughs> right. and chewing broken glass. Um, yeah, actually that's a, a phrase from a friend of mine, a bully, who um, is, uh, early internet entrepreneur has done, done a number of things since, mm -hmm. um, and um, and he, he, he the, he, the the phrase that he uses is like starting a company is like it's like chewing glass and staring into the abyss. Right. Um, so I flipped it. <laughs> yeah, just uh, so it's it's um, I mean there's a point which obviously it's not that not, not that way. Um, Do you still feel like that, or uh, no, is it easy um, now? Um, I, 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 you know, the staring to the abyss part is just, you know, are you are you facing imminent death? And we certainly were at SpaceX and Tesla and Solar City for a long time. I think I don't, we're no longer staring into the abyss, which is mm -hmm. great. There's always going to be some amount of gla glass that's got to be chewed. Um, <laughs> it's never zero, um, but it's less and less um, as as time goes by. So less glass and no more abyss. No, yeah, the abyss is kind of there in the distance, but I'm not staring right <laughs> at it. It's in your peripheral vision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you guys did PayPal, which was, you know, obviously started at a time when the, there was a lot of money and there were advantages, but, you know, yeah. compared to other dot coms, it was a very hard company to build. And then you go on to do It was a hard company to others. keep alive. Yeah. Right. Um, as, as you point out, I mean, uh, pay, PayPal got started in like late 99, late 98 to early 99. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, yeah, it was a sort of merger of two companies, X.com X that I started and uh, Confinity that Max and Peter started. And, and we started to come, sort of pool our resources and, and tackle the problem together. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, but, but 
we, we went from um, starting the company to less than 18 months later, maybe it was 14 months later or something, uh, having a valuation of $500 million. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these, these days, you know, in the, after you see some of the, um, you know, uh, things like uh, the, the recent acquisition by Facebook, you think, oh, well, yeah, maybe that's not that great. Um, <laughs> but, um, but at the time, it was certainly, it was like, this is, this is completely ridiculous. Um, that was, did you feel that way, though? Because yes. I know there were some people was, inside the I company thought was, who thought, why, we, why are we only worth $500 million? I thought it was completely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I mean, the NASDAQ peaked, I think, in March or thereabouts of 2000. Right. And that's around when we, when we did the valuation for $500 million. The, the, the challenge was really keeping the company alive uh, for the next uh, two years, roughly, until, mm -hmm. uh, well, until it was sold to eBay. What, what is you and Peter's relationship like? And what was it like then? There's a, there's a lot of stories that the two of you guys did not get along in that merger. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've had our disagreements, um, but uh, we are friends. Um, <laughs> and um, I would say for 95% of our, the time we've known each other, we've been friends. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that 5% was rough, though, knowing both yeah, of it was you. A little, it was a little rough. Yeah, things were a little bumpy <laughs> at, one, at one point. Um, and uh, I think um, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I have more tolerance for risk than Peter does. Uh, so I, I was sort of maybe more kind of pedal to the metal and Peter was like, well, let's, a little, let's be a little cautious here. Uh, he may have been right, actually. So. Mm -hmm. Which is ironic since he encouraged you to gun your car that made you guys well, vote hitchhike to I don't think that was what he had in mind. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he, uh, um, I'm, pro I'm probably slightly more risk, risk tolerant than Peter is, um, uh, but um, I think it, it, we're, we're at, between all of us, we managed to make PayPal work, which is the, what was, what the, that was the important thing. But back to the back to the abyss and the the broken glass. I mean, do you only enjoy this if you're just the odds are failure? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I'm liking life more and more actually. <laughs> um, as, as there's um, less staring into the abyss and less glass chewing, I'm <laughs> finding that to be a good thing. Um, so um, I, I hope never to return uh, to uh, the experiences I had in 2008 and 2009. So I know back in, I think it was 2008, you talked about if you were to start other companies, one that you had an idea for was an electric plane that could take off and land vertically. Yeah. Does I, that seem, are, are you now like, Fuck no! I am not starting another company. Are you still thinking yes, that? Yes, that's how I feel. <laughs> that is. Um, yeah, I've actually. I mean, there are three things that that I think, uh, well, arguably four, um, that I think could be done. I, I think I could probably do it. Maybe you know have a better than even chance of success. Uh, one is the um, an electric uh, jet. Sort of. A, it's, this would be kind of something cool. Because one of the things that I guess where, the idea, where these things tend to come from is like I'll read something that seems like like a sad thing in technology, and they're mm -hmm. like, well, how could we make it not a sad thing? So when I read about the Concorde being retired, and I was like, oh, geez, you know, we don't even have supersonic transport. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, actually didn't have a chance to, to, to find the Concorde, so um, you know that just seemed like a terrible thing. So initially, I thought, well. Um, I started reading up about it, and I read that that the Concorde it was really designed in the '60s, and, mm -hmm. and so aerodynamics um, have, have improved a great deal with computational fluid dynamics. Uh, engine efficiencies improved massively, and even if you just change the engines on the Concorde, you could double the range, mm -hmm. um, or, or thereabouts. And um, so then I thought, well, okay, well, what if what if you we did figure out a, a really efficient design that could make it uh, economically competitive to have a supersonic um, Aircraft, and, um, and and then I started looking at it more and more, and then um, as I started doing the math on, on on all of it, it seemed like well, you just really want to go higher and higher. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the lower you are in the atmosphere, the more drag you have. Um, atmospheric density decays exponentially, um, so as as you go up, you, you, your your air density just drops drops dramatically, and it's it's really easy to go fast and. I mean, and your speed is just a force balance. It's whatever your, your, the output thrust of the engine is, relative, you know, balanced against the 
uh, the drag that you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So as you go higher, you just go faster for the same force. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and then there's, there's a slight um, uh, outward acceleration you experience, which is also slightly helpful, uh, like, like a satellite. You know, when a satellite's going Mach 25, it, it just goes on forever uh, mm -hmm. once it's out of the atmosphere. So anyway, um, this is maybe slightly the worst, but the, an, an electric uh, fan um, gets better, an electric aircraft gets better the higher you go. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, a combustion aircraft does not. You, have, you, you start starving it, uh, starving it from, from, from oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and only, you know, but, um, the, the air is mostly nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So what, when you, when, as you're going through the air, you're, you're sort of sucking in all this, all this nitrogen, which is uh, kind of slowing you down. Yeah, and, and then you're trying to combust oxygen. Anyway, so um, with, with aircraft, you, uh, with combustion aircraft, you, you hit a, uh, an optimal altitude that's in the sort of um, 35 to maybe 55 max mm -hmm. altitude, uh, whereas an electric aircraft, you could, you know, you'd want to go at like maybe 80,000 feet. Um, mm -hmm. And um, anyway, it's a long, long way of saying you can get super efficient and super fast with, with an electric aircraft. And, and vertical takeoff and landing works well with being supersonic. And um, anyway, so I, I, think, I think you could uh, you can make a really breakthrough aircraft that's for several generations right. beyond what currently exists. But are you going to do that? Not anytime soon. It's possible that I may do it at some point in the future, because between SpaceX and Tesla, I kind of have the ingredients. Um, <laughs> so it's very tempting. Be easy after those. Yeah, um, but I, I, the, 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 uh, I think may, maybe it's worth something worth considering in a few years. Um, that, so that's one idea. Then there's, um, I think w we could really improve uh, transport by um, having a prefabricated. Uh, kind of double-decker, actually what, what would really make sense is uh, a, 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 a steel box beam um, over the center divider mm -hmm. with a, a lane on the inside and a lane on top mm -hmm. um, that's made in prefabricated sections and installed down the center divider. And you can get two lanes and you can have the, the traffic be you know, all one way or all the other right. um, and massively improve life in places like Los Angeles where I was just stuck in traffic going, right. took me an hour to go three miles. Um, <laughs> so. I don't know who's in charge of the damn 405 construction, but they're a bloody idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate them. <laughs> um, it, is, it is the worst construction project I've ever witnessed in my life. Um, I curse them daily. Um, <laughs> OK, so that's two. What are the other two you would do? Uh, well, the other one, um, uh, well, one of the, the third one would be, I, I think you could make fusion work. Um, and and uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and I mean by that I mean magnetic confinement fusion, um, mm -hmm. you know, relatively standard fusion, if you will. Um, and um, and then the fourth one. Um, Photo sharing app, right? <laughs> <laughs> Subscription commerce in a box. Absolutely. Um, the fourth one I'm considering just open sourcing. You know, basically just describing the idea saying this is what would be done, and, um, and if somebody wants to do it, then, then they can do it. Um, but I, I'm thinking, like, maybe I should patent it and then offer to open source the patent to anyone that can make a credible case that they could actually do it. Um, so I'm sort of debating it. But it would be for, for a fifth mode of transport. So right now we've got, of terrestrial transport, we've got planes, uh, trains, automobiles, and boats mm -hmm. um, for getting around Earth. Um, and well, what if there was a fifth mode? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop. Uh, Hyperloop. Yeah. Is yeah. it like a Jetsons tunnel? What? It's something like that. Yeah. Like um, you just get in it, whisks you. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you the characteristics. So, this is partly prompted by the California train thing. Like we yeah. know we've got like a bullet train. Um, that that's like the, it's the it has the dubious distinction of being the slowest bullet train um, <laughs> and the most expensive per mile. Um, Go California. <laughs> we got some superlatives there. Um, uh, so uh, we, we're setting records at both you know both ends of the the wrong the wrong, wrong ends, ends of the of, 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 of the spectrum, and um, you know we, we, apparently it's going to be like sixty billion dollars or something. Uh, to go from San Francisco to LA, and if it's if they're saying 60 now, it's going to be more later. Right. Um, 
and of course, it's a really slow, and slow like, train. And to put this in perspective, 100 million got you into space. Well, it got me start. I mean, it got it got me to yeah. It certainly got me into space and quite get, <laughs> get, get me into billion. orbit very close. Yes, yes, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. In terms of cap of, of cap of venture capital investment, it's been a couple hundred million total, including outside investors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and SpaceX has been profitable for the last few years. So, um, I, I think we can do do something that's probably 10 percent of the cost. And 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 I, I try to think of what are the attributes that you'd want in a new mode of transport. Um, in fact, what is the theoretically fastest way that you could get from LA to San Francisco? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so, so the system I have in mind, which is you've, you're sort of you're guessing in the right direction. Um, sort of, how, how do you like something that uh, can never crash? Mm -hmm. um, it is immune to weather. Um, it goes uh, three or four times faster than the, the, the sort of bullet train that's Your being built. Your supersonic jet. Well, it, it, will, it goes about let's say an average speed of twice. Uh, what, uh, what what an aircraft would, would do. So you go from downtown LA to downtown San Francisco in under 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket or car, much less than any other mode of transport, because the fundamental energy cost is, is so much lower. And I think uh, we could actually make it self-powering self -power, self if you just uh, if you put solar panels on it, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it you, you, you generate. My rough back of the envelope is you generate more power uh, than you than you would consume in the system, um, and there's a way to store the power so that it would run 24/7 mm -hmm. um, without using batteries. Uh, so you, there's different you can you know, diff different ways to store energy. Um, anyway, so that's. Do you think this is possible? This is not just. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. Is there ever a time you retire? You have five children. Right. You ever just want to hang out with the kids? Um, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to hang out with the kids. I don't want to retire, but I do want to hang out with the kids. Um, my goal is to retire right before senility. Um, <laughs> it's a tough, you know, tough, you know. See, it's like your, being your crazy. Judgment starts like, to be impaired. You know? Yeah, it's like getting hypoxia. You don't like, you don't realize your your decisions suck uh, until you're dead. Um, so, um, so I don't intend to retire. Maybe at like at 80 or something. Um, and uh, it would be cool to be born on Earth and die on Mars. Yeah. Yeah, you've said before you want to retire on Mars. Is this more what? or less feasible? Um, well, actually, it was asked, do I? Um, it's more like if I were to retire, it's not like I want to retire, but if I were to, to retire on the verge of senility, I'd like it to be on Mars. That would be cool. <laughs> it's funny because you were saying earlier that you're slightly more um, risk taking than Peter. Peter wants to be on a boat that's like an island out somewhere that has no laws. You want to be on Mars. It is the slightly well, riskier, crazy version. Yeah. Um, I think Peter entertains a lot of interesting ideas. I'm not sure he necessarily wants to be on an island offshore. Um, I mean, last time I saw him, he was in San Francisco. Uh, so, um, but but I think he likes to. He sort of entertains um, interesting ideas, and he's not bound by convention, certainly. That's for sure. All right, well, we want to get some questions from the audience. So we've got a couple of microphones. If anyone wants to line up, while we're waiting on people, um, you're an investor in Stripe, and a very tiny investor. Very tiny investor, and I have no idea what they're doing. Um. <laughs> wow, I know. This is the only subject where I know more than you. Okay. I talked to them the other day. But which leads me to the question: Do you think PayPal is finally screwed? Well, if if PayPal doesn't do something, it will be screwed. Yes. There has not uh, been a lot of innovation. No. In fact, if if you look at the product plan that I wrote um, in 2000, uh, th there's hardly any difference. In fact, it's it's slightly worse than that. You've gone backwards. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, PayPal should be where all the money is. Yeah. And it's not. It's definitely not. All right. Go ahead. Hi there. I first wanted to thank you, Sarah, for believing in LA. I, I was actually up at one of the events in San Francisco, and I think we have two to three times as many people here. So uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is the same. It's actually 100 people fewer than we fit in our, in our San Francisco venue. But 
it sold out the fastest. All right. So Ben Horowitz sold out in about four hours, and you sold out in three. All right. <laughs> and you have a, a writer here, Michael, so thank you for believing in LA. I think my we are the only blog with a full-time writer here. There you go. Uh, my question is for you, Alon. First of all, thank you for doing these big things to you know, improve humanity. I worked for Space Adventures when I was in college. All right, cool, yeah. And I really believe in the space frontier, the abyss, uh, so to speak. <laughs> the, uh, the good abyss, yeah. But uh, <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but just thinking about LA uh, for a moment, uh, what do you think we can do to improve this, the ecosystem here uh, in LA? Well, I think better freeways would be huge. Um, honestly, I, I, don't, I, I, I wish there was like, who do I complain to about the, the freeways? Uh, um, yeah, yeah so some, somebody's got to be responsible for it. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> don't do that. I'd rather you build jets and hyperloops than be the mayor of LA. Um, but I, I think if somebody could, um, seriously, it's like if improving the transport system, it, that's got to be, for anyone that lives in LA, what's going to be the number one gripe? It's, it's the damn highways. I tried to run a startup uh, to do that, but no one would fund me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Ending gridlock.org. <laughs> I'm open to funding Don't someone if they, if they want to do the box beam thing over the center divider, um, mm -hmm. which would be, I mean, a regulatory challenge, but I, I mean, I think people, you can get people to vote for it. I'd vote for it in like three seconds. Um, and it's just, you've got to do it in a way that it doesn't impede the existing traffic flow. And the, so it's got to be prefabricated sections that just get dropped in place like Lego. Mm -hmm. Why did you move to LA? Uh, because the, uh, Southern California has the biggest concentration of aerospace engineers in the world. Oh. Um, and it was a choice. I, my, I mean, I lived in, in uh, um, the Bay Area for 10 years and lived, lived in Palo Alto. Um, I lived like three, three blocks away from the PayPal office. That's why PayPal is on University Avenue, because I lived on Forest. Mm -hmm. um, which is really convenient. So um, I moved down to LA just because the, the odds of success with a rocket company were pretty low to begin with. And if I insisted that experienced uh, air, uh, aerospace engineers move from Southern California to the Bay Area and kind of leave their job mm -hmm. and buy, and buy a house in the Bay Area, which is really expensive, right. then, then the odds of success would, would, go, would, would be decreased even further. So um, that, that, that's why I moved to, to LA is, mm -hmm. is all right. Yeah. I want to try to get through as many of these questions as possible, but because we do not have Elon for much longer. So let's ask him real quick and answer real quick. Okay? All right. Okay. Hey, Elon. Huge fan of yours. So thank you so much for inspiring young entrepreneurs all over the world. Um, quick question. One of the area of um, innovation is in the area of education, right? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what are some of the ways that we can disrupt or to, to you know, in the area of education. Thanks. Right. Um, well, what... Um, Sebastian Thrun is doing, um, and uh, Salman Khan, I mean, I think that's real, those, that stuff is really disruptive. Um, sorry. Um, and yeah, so, so what Sebastian Thrun and, and, Salman, and, and Khan are doing are, is that that's great stuff, sort of online learning. Um, and I think there's, a, if, to, the, to the degree that you can gamify learning, I think that's really helpful. Um, most, uh, you, you want to make learning not uh, a chore. Um, if, if people are drawn to it, like they're drawn to video games, then um, then I think that would really help. What do you think about Peter's whole getting people to drop out of college thing? Um, yeah, I think I think going to college is you know entirely optional. I mean, it's if, if you've got a good, if, you, if you've got a good idea, um, I, I'd say drop out and try it out. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, you can always go back to college. Nobody's. It's know. always there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Honda and Mercedes have both sort of said to me very clearly they feel hydrogen fuel cells are the future, huh. but I believe strongly in batteries. <laughs> I know. I mean, why really. do you think they're so behind? <laughs> why do you think they're so committed to hydrogen as like the next step? Whereas batteries, I really feel like we can make this happen. Um, I don't really know because the the math is so super obviously in favor of batteries um, that it's like it's like staring facts in the face and saying they're not true. Um, if you take the best case scenario for a fuel cell and you say you know, forget about it's like assume it's fully optimized. So you 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 can you you can envelope it from a physics standpoint, um, and say and give it the best case situation. How does that compare to state of the art lithium ion or, or current current lithium ion in production? Um, and it loses. So so it's like success is not one of the possible outcomes. Why, why embark upon that? Um, it's crazy. I, I think part of it is like there's, there's they felt for a long time that there was this need to be doing something. Um, and since fuel cells were 10 years in the future and always would be, then they could always say they're working on fuel cells, and that, and that would satisfy people. Um, you don't have to deliver. Yeah. 
It's Tesla, it Tesla called it full cells. Um, <laughs> All right, great. Go ahead. Hey there. Um, my name is Richard Cooperstein. I was an early executive at Facebook where I headed up all of the international business development, corporate development, and strategy. And so, you know, thinking big was something that, you know, has been a part of my DNA uh, from those days and before. And so as I look at all the things that you've um, been building, obviously it resonates very much. So in order to build the things that you're building, obviously you need sources of capital and you have, you know, a sort of network of people around you. I recently partnered with a group called LiquidNet, and they think about um, providing liquidity on a nine-figure and up kind of basis. And they've created this really dynamic platform where they have 700 partners who all have an average of $20 billion under management, which equals about $14 trillion. And what they're trying to do is identify really tremendous technology companies, biotech, pharma, and that kind of thing, and space being sort of the next frontier. My question to you is, where do you think you know, the next big buckets of efficiency are for you in your capital formation efforts vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, really finding that way to Mars and finding that way to kind of create the next, uh, the next uh, wave of humanity out in the, in, the, in the wider universe. And, you know, we have a platform that provides for that. My question is, is where do you find, you know, efficient sources of capital or is a platform like what we have something that would serve your needs? Well, in my case, um, I, I find the public markets to be a, a pretty effective source of capital. Um, it's, it's worked out well for, for Tesla. Um, and Solar City will probably go public later this year. Um, and so generally, um, you know, so, so all, and, 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 and SpaceX it, it could go public at any point. It's, it doesn't need, SpaceX has been cash flow positive for a few years, so it doesn't really need, doesn't really need additional capital. Um, so actually, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, at this point, I do not feel myself to be capital constrained. Um, but, but, I, but going public is, is more efficient for you than, than sort of staying private, you know, thinking about what's been happening in the, in the public markets and sort of the, the gyrations and the need for public disclosure and all that kind of stuff. You think that's more efficient? Um, yeah, I actually don't find it to be too much of a problem um, to, be, to be a public company. Um, and I mean, I kind of run... Uh, the, the private companies like their public companies um, in, in terms of, you know, having the, uh, you know, the, the appropriate controls in place and, and mechanisms for effective governance. Um, I don't, I, th I don't think it's actually that bad to be a public company, and, and unless, uh, if, if unless you're going to sort of get really um, concerned about the day-to-day -day fluctuations in the stock price, that. So as long as you, you just say, look, uh, is the stock price going to fluctuate day to day and I don't care, um, then you know, that, that, that's the only time it's an issue. Just, you just shouldn't worry about the day to day fluctuations too much. What do you think about uh, the trend of the dual class shares and this whole idea like being pushed by right. Andreessen Horowitz and others of basically you need a fortress to go public? Um, I think uh, there, there can be some merit to a dual class. I mean, Tesla has a single class um, and, and there's there's some merit to a dual class. I think it can be taken to a bit of an extreme in some cases where it's a dual class or one class basically doesn't count. Right. Um, I think that's, that's probably a bit unreasonable. Um, we, 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 you know, you need, there needs to be some path towards ultimately, I think, um, having a single class mm -hmm. because you, you just get the succession problem. Right. Um, and it's just, it's just rare that, say, somebody's successor uh, particularly if it's of their kid, <laughs> um, is, is, is the right person. It, is, it does happen, but it's unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but I mean, there are cases where it's been well managed, say like with, the, uh, with Ford, like Ford was the only company not to, go, not to go bankrupt. And one could argue that the Ford family was a stabilizing influence on the company um, and had more long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, um, like I said, I think there's merits to, to having a dual-class uh, uh, of ownership, um, as long as it's not taken to an extreme. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting a sign that we can only take one more question. Yeah, so and I, I apologize. I'm, I'm actually supposed to be at a, at, a, at a screening for a film at, about Haiti, and that's actually where I inadvertently went first oh, oh no. uh, and why I was so late. <laughs> oh, no. um, so, but I, I absolutely have to show up um, there All right. because it's... So I apologize, you guys, um, but you're getting the last one. All right, um, so I, I work in the space industry out here as well, so I appreciate the things you're doing with SpaceX. Um, you tweeted yesterday that you thought we were gonna be in, at Mars in 40 years, and we haven't been to the moon in 40 years, so I was wondering what SpaceX's plan is for that. Yeah, actually I was, I was saying that I thought we, we could 
conceivably be at Mars around 12 to 15 years from now. Um, and uh, SpaceX is, is, is continuing to develop the technology beyond Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy. Um, and um, on, you know, on paper, at least, uh, um, I think we've got a system that could achieve um, uh, Mars colonization. Um, there's a long way from having such a system on paper or electronically, really. I don't really have it on paper. Um, uh, and, and actually making it real. Um, but it was only maybe a year or two ago that, uh, less than two years ago, that, that I concluded that it was possible uh, to, um, uh, just to, have to create a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. That's, uh, yeah. So I, I read earlier a quote from you that said, that, that Mars was just this side of impossible, or is it yeah. further than this side of impossible? No, it's, I, I believe it's possible, just extremely difficult. Okay. Yeah. So, but I, I wasn't sure it was possible until about a year and a half ago. Uh huh. So last thing, um, we we always ask everybody um, a series of questions, and the the crowd favorite is always, what would be your mediocre superpower? Now. This is absurd to okay. ask you because Tony Stark is partially modeled after you. Right. So you actually are sort of have real. So we are actually well, doesn't technically have a superpower. He, I guess, <laughs> except like inventing technology or something. Right. So we're sort um, of asking you to downgrade from that a bit. So an example of a medio mediocre superpower would be um, the, one of the best ones we've ever gotten is this guy who wished to um, temporarily detach his arm while spooning with a girl. Um, sometimes it's it's sometimes it's that, staying. That's what he wants to do with a girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, sometimes it's like staying perfectly caffeinated. That's some okay. people's. Um, the other day, my nanny had a great one, um, which was to inflict menstrual cramps on her enemies. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, so, what what would yours be? A, a mediocre superpower. Mm -hmm. So it can't. Because be I think like, the most awesome superpower would just be to, to be lucky. Um, and uh, one would say you have been. Yeah. yeah. So if you could dial I mean, that back ways. slightly. Um, <laughs> uh, what what would be a good a mediocre superpower? Um, I, I think it, it, you know, we're talking mediocre superpowers here. I yeah. think to, to just to always beat the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an appropriate way to end All tonight. Right. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things. Um, we're, we're not going to do LA monthly, but we are going to do it regularly. So we'll do two or three more of these before the end of the year, and we will try to have as impressive guests as Elon. Um, we have a couple in mind already that I think will be surprising. Um, if anyone would like to sponsor these events, we are a for-profit company, and we are trying to make money. Um, you can email. Uh, me at Sarah at PandoDaily.com, and I will get you to the right people. As you can see, it's an amazing event. You should absolutely give us money so we can keep doing it and pay people like Michael who cover LA companies. Um, next week, if you're in San Francisco, we have Mark Pincus. Um, we would love to see you there. And uh, other than that, let's just give a huge round of applause to Elon.